Happy New Year, everyone. This is the Daily Tech News Show for Monday, January 2nd, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. 2022 is over. It's in the past, but it was filled with some fun and fact-filled conversations, both on Daily Tech News Show and the extended show Good Day Internet. So we challenged our video producer, Joe, to pick the best conversations we had all year and put them together in one concentrated bundle of joy, information, and gladness. Here they are. Enjoy. I want to welcome everyone uh, to the ninth year of Daily Tech News Show. Kudos to you, Tom Merritt. <laughs> oh, thank uh, you. Well, yeah. seriously, though, I mean, that that's a good run. There's and only one other thing that I have done for nine years. Marriage. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Being a child. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Yeah. Being a child. True. Well, that's true. East meets West. Yes. I, oh, I've done did... East meets West longer. We'll have to do Is one for this. Is that still going? One. Yeah. It's an irregular show, much like my bowel movements. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know what? Uh... Happy New Year. <laughs> I, I've been there, my bro. Been there. Anyway, thank you, Sarah. Uh, and thank you for, for helping to make this show uh, last through eight years of Roger's life. Yeah. Simple Listen, state you know, sometimes you're just not consistent. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella delineated cloud, community, and content. Mentioned that yesterday as three main areas the acquisition of Activision Blizzard addresses. Why do they want it? Who wouldn't want to take the big money from the big titles on consoles and PC and put them in front of that huge mobile audience? Cross-platform cloud services marry the big title attraction and money with the big mobile platform. An easy way to have Microsoft-owned games on PlayStation, though, would be to have Game Pass available on PlayStation. Microsoft's going to have 32 internal studios if this acquisition goes through. Sony right now has 17. So Microsoft will have an edge in content. In the case of Sony and Microsoft, this is where the war is. And I think this signals Microsoft saying, we don't care about what's happening on the ground of this war. We care about what's happening in the air of this war or what will happen in the future of this war. It's not about the console wars anymore or hardware. It's about dominance and services and bringing games to people on whatever platform they're on. That's a game changer just in terms of the conversation. So I think there is a future where Sony, but other platform holders of lots of types, Roku and, and Amazon Fire Sticks and uh, mm -hmm. Apple TVs and a lot of people would maybe line up and say, well, Microsoft is like, it's like Netflix now and we all want Netflix apps on our devices, right? Why aren't we, you know, why aren't we making a deal with those guys? Uh, Satya Nadella is like, hey, remember when everybody thought we were crazy for giving away Windows because that was our big money maker, uh, and then uh, suddenly we were dominant in cloud, and Microsoft Azure made us more profitable than ever, and we're a hugely profitable company. Let's do that in gaming. And they and, have all and, the back end to and do it, and they can the do other it. part that they have is uh, being able to compete nicely. They make hardware, and yet also have hardware makers as clients. So they may be trying to, to look at Sony and say like, hey, we make Surface stuff at HP still fine with us. We could be the same way. I think that's their plan to continue is to say, oh, all right, well, if you don't want it, that's okay. And then they'll just keep making it bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger and they'll have all the studios in the world. And before you know it, everybody's doing some form of Game Pass. I think that's what they want. PlayStation Plus is running on Azure, then it's in Microsoft's best interest to have PlayStation Plus be very successful so they still keep getting money from Sony for Azure. Yeah. And when we talk about this, how they've got like so much that they would not control, but like, we have you on Azure. We also have Game Pass. We own all these studios and we just spent 70 billion on whoever. It starts to smell a little fishy, even though I'm stoked about it and generally have optimism about it. It's still starting to feel a little like someone's going to get talked to, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Ask, ask the movie industry how, uh, how the world felt about them owning the theaters, the distribution, and the content, the movies. Uh, and they, they broke that up. I told uh, the rest of the folks that Otis the dog and I had quite an event last night. Oh? It was about 8 p.m. or so last night. It's dark. It's rainy. And so I was like, hey, you know what, buddy, just go out and do your business, you know, just do your business. Um, and, you know, let's get back in and get comfy. And I was kind of outside, but I'm looking at my phone, <laughs> speaking of that. And all of a sudden I hear, splash. And I'm like, <laughs> what was that? 
Otis is in the pool. He's fallen in. He doesn't know how to swim. Oh. Uh, we're, we're, he doesn't know if he knows how to swim, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Like, he's like, I've never been in this situation. It's just I never happened before, yeah, yeah. you know? So I'm like, swim to me, swim this way, come to this side. Look, there's a step, you know? And he's just like flailing, flailing. And finally I'm like, it was, it was like a Seinfeld episode where I'm like, I'm going in. <laughs> All right. I'm going into this pool right now. A very, very cold pool at 8 PM, fully clothed, shoes on, whole thing. Um, wow. Because I'm going to get my dog. We got out okay. Otis is still mortified. He's never going to that <laughs> pool again. Oh, uh, <laughs> mortified. Yeah. I mean, for hours last night, he just kept looking at me and shaking and being like, what was that? And I'm like, I'm sorry, buddy. You jumped in the pool. I don't know why. <laughs> Thank you, Trish. And not one mention of MetaMates. <laughs> What's MetaMates? It's Meta's new thing. When you have friends on Meta, they're your Meta mates. Oh, oh I, I hate it. <laughs> I do too. I do too. <laughs> I just the whole Meta thing. I'm like, everyone knows VR chat and Second Life exists, right? Yeah, mates. I don't know. I think mates. I think like going out with your buddies. I guess. Sure. Yeah. I'm all, I'm all right with that. There's something about pairing it with Meta. Maybe it's the alliteration. Mm. Maybe because we now are just sick of the word Meta and everything. That's it. Ding, ding, ding. We have a Bingo. winner. Bingo. I used to get grasshopper pie at Red Lobster. I would get the free breadsticks and then I would leave. <laughs> breadsticks? They didn't have the breadsticks at Red there. Lobster. Breadsticks is a loose term. Gotham uh, Heights claims they are called Cheddar Bay Biscuits. Ah. Cheddar no, Bay? I don't remember them <laughs> I think being they're that. Cheddar Bay Biscuits, not Cheddar Bay Biscuits. Oh, it's a, from uh, Cheddar Bay, but it could be your bay. Nor is it a you... an inlet from the ocean <laughs> made entirely of cheddar. Oh, good. Thank goodness, because I would swim in Cheddar Bay. Oh my gosh, yeah. And just yeah, kind of imp- open mouthed. Mm-hmm. Just like, yeah. Mm. I mean, it's probably not super great a, for you, but I would, I would sail it, it in a boat made of tortilla chips. Yeah, great. If you construct the boat correctly, you sail on top of the cheddar. You're gonna, you know, you're. You will sink eventually. Right. But you've got a little time. You need a lot of chips so you can row. And the way you row is you dip a chip in and then just eat it. And then you Mm -hmm. get another chip. Yeah. And then you walk out of the water, which is a sea of cheddar. Which is cheddar. And your boat is gone because you ate it. Yeah. And if you time it right, you arrive right as your boat is done. And you don't arrive hungry. Uh, Scott, how do you feel about NFTs? I don't like them. Um, I noticed. You yeah, seem to have uh, very pointed comments about them on the I do have very pointed comments. that I follow. Okay. My problem with NFTs as currently constituted or as currently, I don't know, as as, as that space is currently being run and, 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 you know, used is that it doesn't take in the perspective of the artist very often. And I don't mean the artist selling an NFT or something like that. What I mean is there's very little artfulness in it. There's not a lot of soul in it. Also, because of its current, again, this is really important that I try to emphasize this, its current scammy nature. And what really did it to me was the two separate emails I got from people who took some of my art from my webpage. They'll take it somewhere, mint it, and then come back to me and say, you better buy this before someone else does. None of this is artful. It's very transactiony it's, and very, very monetized just, bleh, like it's just so, feels gross right now it's gross if i if, if i understand you what you mean isn't the technology as you said it's what a lot of people are doing with them i am 100 percent sure that there is a future in all of this i know there is the coexistence of artful beginning and smart investing can coexist in a scam as scam free as possible environment. I know it's never completely a hundred percent. It's wild west. Like you said, it is very wild west. And here's the thing about the gold rush. How many people found gold in those rivers when they went out there? A very, very small percentage compared to the vast amount that got sick and died going out there. You know who, ma- who made some of the most money out of, out of the gold rush? Mm. Levi Strauss. <laughs> yeah, because the selling pants he made. stuff to the gold rush people, yeah. including jeans, including jeans. Right, <laughs> selling equipment. There are people. There are stories about multi-millionaire yeah. now billionaire family lines that their entire claim to fame was they went to San Francisco in the 1800s, set up a shop that sold shovels and picks, 
yeah. and made bank. I was like, and another thing about baseball, and here I am like, ha! I'm like relaxing, uh, looking That's off into the amazing, distance. to be honest. I with. know. It's pretty. Oh, I it's see like, it. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. <laughs> wow, look at Skype. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're leaving you, Skype. We'll Stick out your use. tongue. Stick out your tongue. This is great for the audio. Uh-huh. Just, it doesn't really work that well. Yeah. Yeah. Just surprise Pikachu face. It, uh, it, for, for folks <laughs> on audio, Skype has a filter that turns Sarah's actual face it's, into an anime it's, character. It's Snap Camera. Oh, yeah, oh, it's Snap. Favorite. It's not Skype. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you can't see this, uh, audio listeners, but uh, Sarah has become a radish. I am. I'm a radish. Ah, because you're yeah. rad. I'll tell you, it doesn't, I, it, it doesn't it, work that well. You're a daikon it, icon. Of all of all the filters, I feel like being a radish is one of the I, last I things like I. I feel, it's oh. it, it's a bit of a ravishing radish too. It look it looks it looks very uh, yeah. uh, uh very potent. ready to be painted. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, yeah, it is a little uh, uh Kate Winslet in the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh, I I How's don't play with filters very often, but when you do, you're like, this is fun. Yeah. L- look, I can become a. This one's called the nun. Oh not, God. Not a very nice nun. Oh, that's I think a that zombie. One, I think that's there was this nun. horror movie called The Nun. Well, that's probably what this is. That's probably about. It. Yeah. Because yeah. that one I know. Is- I know. Audio listeners are like, this is lame. Very Nobody ghoul- wants to talk about filters. Black and but- white, ghoulish. Uh- yeah, no, that's going to give me nightmares. That's hard. Sorry. Horrible. All right, I'll turn it off. Despite the Beijing Olympics attempts to promote a message of international cooperation, Russia declared a peacekeeping operation and mobilized land, air, and sea operations to invade. The military actions were accompanied by cyber attacks on government websites and servers. It was 2008. That's what I'm talking about. Russia invaded Georgia in support of two self-declared republics in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. That was 2008. That was 14 years ago. But they say history rhymes. 14 years later, right here in 2022, shortly after another Beijing Olympics, Russia once again declared it would conduct a peacekeeping operation in support of two self-declared republics, this time in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. But the world is reacting much differently to the Ukrainian invasion than it did to the one of Georgia in 2008. Let's start with cyber attacks. Even if they are targeted at Ukraine, malware often leaks out elsewhere on the internet, and the attacks may not focus solely on Ukraine. So it's good to be aware of this, even if you're not in Ukraine. We mentioned yesterday that denial of service attacks continue against Ukrainian government and financial websites. That has not stopped. Uh, The Verge notes that Cloudflare is reporting that Ukrainian ISPs are mostly operating, uh, with the exception of some connections in Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, disrupted. In addition to denial of service attacks, ESET uh, says it discovered a data wiper malware installed on hundreds of machines in Ukraine. In one organization, attackers had appeared to be able to take control of Active Directory and then push the wiper via the default domain policy. Uh, This is one where collateral damage could get you. Uh, Maybe it wasn't meant for you, but maybe that wiper shows up in your system somewhere, so it's good to know about it. It's important to be aware of this stuff, even if you're not necessarily directly in the line of fire. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that there are a few things that we should we should keep in mind here. Number one, while both of them involve the internet, I do think that it's helpful for us to separate out cyber attacks like denial of service and malware from the idea of propaganda. It's not to say that they are not often from the same areas, but uh, one of them is a different threat than an info war. You should always Think twice before believing something you see on a social network these days, right now, maybe think three times, four times. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is like a daily fight that people have on the internet of you're not paying enough attention. You're just blindly retweeting that video and that video is fake and here's why. And, you know, that's it's like 30 percent of the conversation when it comes to getting your news information from social media. That is a peacetime treat. We do not have we we do it, when when we are talking about well time said. war, we should probably not be going on the dumbest websites on the planet in general. This is before we even get into state run agit prop. Uh, 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 probably just to try to find slightly more sober, level headed sources than the things that are getting the most retweets on the bird app. Scientists analyzed electrical activity of ghost fungi, enoki fungi, and split gill fungi. They assumed that the spikes were used to communicate in a mycelial network and grouped the spikes into words 
for linguistic analysis. The uh, split gill fungi had the most complex sentences. There are many similarities in information processing in living substrates of different classes, families, and species. I was just curious to compare. Uh, man, the split gill fungi vocabulary is just ridiculous, right? Like they, you ever sit down with a split gill fungi and you're like, whoa, college yeah. boy, you know, hey, using your yeah. $6 word. We get it. You have an MBA. I, I totally prefer a conversation with a ghost fungi because yeah. of that. It's just more straightforward. Yeah, if you can. I mean, uh, we've mentioned before the show and I'm going to bring it up now. So Star Trek people beware, but... Um, I'm now starting to think that Star Trek Discovery was onto something with this whole, we're going to travel through space much faster because turns out space mushrooms have all kinds of cool ways to make things happen in space. Because I kind of thought it was real dumb before. Now I'm not sure I was right. Maybe yeah. it's cool. I mean, some of this was already known before this particular paper, sure. and that's what they were riffing on in Discovery. But it is really cool to see like, oh, no, we didn't disprove it. We just took it a little bit farther yeah. into understanding the mycelial network whether we can use it to traverse space and time eh. folks it. in the chat what did you think about our explanation of the law did you find it useful did did you follow it let us know yeah i like yep. i like the back and forth way of doing that yeah i mean I, I, have you have you gotten a lot of feedback on that i'd say like 70 to 80 percent people are like i really like that you're doing the like back and forth it's easier to follow people bring up questions that i have uh the 20% who don't like it think it sounds scripted. More accurately, what they are trying to say is this sounds like a different script format. And I got used to the previous. Yeah, but that's true, too, because it was it was written <laughs> out before. I uh, hate to pull back the curtain and show the show, show the man controlling the Wizard of Oz. But uh, every time that I've been on any version of this show, I have had things in front of me that I was reading. DTNS is an informative show, and I think at a, a a byproduct of that is that the reads can get very dense because DTNS will never spare you the knowledge for the sake of you know uh, 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 you know aesthetics. Like DTNS, it's why it has a, a following the way that it does. So this, yes. I, I like to say DTNS knowledge, not that's it exactly. But we, we use that all the time. Only in post show. <laughs> Why not both? Not first. <laughs> first. So first knowledge, then Jamaican air horns. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right, right. There's a priority <laughs> level. There is a priority. There's priority to all of it. I'm wondering now, after, you know, 20 some years of doing that, whether that battle is over. Uh, English is a living language, and sometimes you just have to admit that the language has moved on. Is hacker one of those words? Is it generally a negative term now? Jack, I, I can't imagine you haven't given this some thought yourself. <laughs> yeah, I think um, hacker has become such a common day parlance term. I mean, I'm thinking immediately lifehacker.com, mm. hack a day. Um, there's a book mm. called Parenting Hacks. I mean, th I've got an aunt who's not into computers much at all, yet when I go with her to the, the smoothie shop, she's like, I've got a hack on how to get, uh, you know, a certain kind of smoothie that they can't make on the menu or something. Like, check it out. And I'm like, that's not a hack. And and I, <laughs> But I love how everyone thinks that they're a hacker just because they can navigate a food menu properly. Um, <laughs> so I think that term, I, I mean, if my aunt is using it and she doesn't have that um, you know, hacking mentality, like we imagine what a hacker sounds like, um, what is hack anymore, right? And so uh, I think it it definitely doesn't have a negative connotation, just in the sense of like, yeah, I've got a, I've got a travel hack, or I've got a parenting mm -hmm, hack, mm -hmm. like that's totally not negative at all. That's a great thing. Oh, I want I want to hear about that. Tell me about your parenting hack. And so yeah, I, I take I take, a, you know, I disagree with the idea that hack has such a negative term. I think it's used very commonly now. Quinn, you made a video saying that Apple might have accidentally made the best gaming notebook on the market. For example, we played The Witcher 3, and that was something that this is an x86 Windows binary that's running. Uh, it's being virtualized by Windows ARM, which is being virtualized by Parallels inside of the Mac, which DirectX is being virtualized into or, uh, into Metal. And so it's just there's so many different layers to this onion that by the time you get to the end, you're like, this has got to be abysmal. And it 
in some cases is actually playable. So the, the next obvious step would be um, if you can't virtualize Windows, maybe you can emulate something less advanced. And so emulation on the, the new Macs is actually fantastic. There's Dolphin, which has long been known as one of the best Wii and GameCube emulators. Um, and so the question becomes, well, what if you could run titles that were designed and built for the Mac on the Mac? And the problem is, is that, well, those don't really exist mm -hmm. um, because the Mac has never been a place where gaming has been much of a thing. It's just a matter of getting the games. I, I get what you're saying now, which is they made the best gaming laptop. They just didn't create uh, all the on-ramps, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, to, to, to make it easy for, for developers to, to transport it over there. It's the best laptop display, period. And so to see all of that available in a price point that's only marginally more expensive than the best PC gaming laptops is really exciting. The downside is that we come back to Apple and software. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know that that's going to change. In fact, in, in 2018, uh, the Wall Street Journal reported that Apple had recorded an $8.8 .8 billion net profit in that fiscal year, which was more than Sony, Microsoft, Activision, and yeah. Nint Nintendo combined, <laughs> right? Yeah. So Apple is just making an extraordinary amount of money on the App Store. And I think because of that, they haven't really cared to push into a much more competitive kind of AAA gaming market. But they now have the hardware to do that where previously they didn't. Well, 3D printing is pretty great. You can 3D print tools for various projects. You can print art sculptures. You could even print something simple to replace a broken part around your house. But for a lot of people, unless you're already part of a DIY or maker community, getting started with 3D printing can be a little intimidating. Let's say you're starting out and you've got nothing. You're like, you know what? I... I've seen Joel, I've seen others talk about 3D printing. I'm interested, how do I get started? I, it's, a, it's a great way to think about it because a lot of times uh, necessity drives the need. There's a, there's a lot of people that get started with 3D printing because um, perhaps they're doing D&D &D miniatures or they have uh, role-playing games where they have miniatures and they wanna be able to make those in real life. Or there are projects around the house that, that need the advantages that 3D printing has, jigs and fixtures, and uh, little things to kind of help with day-to-day -day life. Um, once once you've identified, and I mean, and also uh, another need is just because it's really cool. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to lie to you. It's <laughs> it's just really cool. So if you if you can define your need, then being able to pick out a machine and a material to use really is just part of the next process. It's it's more simple to get into additive manufacturing, 3D printing now than it ever has been before. Filament is the material that 3D mm -hmm. printers use, uh, but they're not all the same, right? How do you know what kind of filament you need? A really simple material for 3D printing is called PLA. It's uh, corn-based and it, it melts at one of the lower temperatures. Uh, it comes in lots of pretty colors uh, and it's just, uh, it's, it's one of the easiest materials to print with. Um, but I would imagine if you if you had a specific use in mind, then you would go researching the right material for the job because all mm -hmm. sorts of materials have different temperatures that they melt at. They have different uh, mechanical properties as far as stretching or rigidity or being able to uh, withstand certain limits. Um, it's it's one of those things, and I, and I liken it to to being able to utilize a tool for something else. If you're going to build something, you're going to do some research into the right materials of how you're going to build it. It's it's exactly the same with the filaments for 3D printing. If you're just doing some decorative things, there's a good chance that PLA is going to work for you. Uh, if it's going to exist outside and it's really sunny where you're at, there's a filament called ASA, which has some UV resistance. Um, if it has to withstand really high temperatures, perhaps you go with something called ABS. It's the same material that Lego is made from. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you have to think about a material with um, that has to replace a metal part in an industry. Well, you can look at materials like uh, Peak, PEC, or Ultim, and those materials are in, on the industrial side, but those can actually be... Um, the geometries that you can print with these materials can actually sometimes replace uh, metals. Wow. So, all right, this is, let's say, you know, I'm thinking of projects around my house. I actually have a towel rack that broke recently. It's and you kind of will probably have a general idea of what you want. And if you could on paper, you could start to sketch some things just to kind of how it would look. 
And then you go to a 3D program such as uh, Tinkercad, which is web-based, and it's essentially shape math. You can you can take a, uh, a cube and add a sphere to it and then subtract that sphere from the cube and you're left with this 3D geometry. So now Ooh. using, using uh, that sort of thinking, you can go build yourself the towel rack ends and then you can print them out and then you can try it out. And if it doesn't work or if it doesn't look exactly like what you're thinking, the great part about this 3D printing is you've probably only used pennies worth of material and you can go through in Tinkercad and adjust your design little bits here and there and then print it out again and try it again. That's amazing. I set up my 25 year old self uh, to be, I'm 25, live in Austin, Texas in 1995. Yeah. So in the description, it says this, this person lives in 1995. I work at half price books and just dropped out of grad school. I'm working on a website, make a zine and drink a lot at the Texas showdown saloon. <laughs> the first thing I said was what's up. And it said, not much. I spent last night at the Texas showdown and was really drunk this morning. <laughs> I'm like, I was like mm -hmm. accurate, accurate for 1995. <laughs> me. Can I ask you some advice? I have a crush on this girl in my poetry group. <laughs> And then he talked about there's this other girl, Marcy, and she's beautiful, but she's always hanging around with this guy, Steve. Uh, but, you know, so should I go with Carrie? <laughs> I was like, wow, you really are 25. The yeah, bot. That's what Good. you thought about when you were 25. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, for, for some of the listeners may be interested in this, I don't know, but there's a, a pre-built bot up there, a chat bot called the Text Adventure Game. And I got into that pretty quickly just to kind of see what's up. I thought it would be sort of like Zork, but then who knew where it would go and it would get weird and break down. Actually, it's way fun. And I'm close to convinced that might be the future of some text adventure gaming. Uh, maybe already is for all I know, but uh, it's great. It asks, it basically starts out with you hanging from a, from a sticky giant spider web and there's a boot knife on the ground within reach. It starts that way for everybody. But from there, you can go anywhere, pick up the knife, leave the knife use the knife to cut the web uh put the knife into your toe and see what happens. like you can go nuts with it and it will build a story around your decisions and choices and you only have so many hit points so it tracks that and if you get hurt it minuses your hit points and if you gather things it remembers that you got those things and they're now part of your loot or your you know whatever you've looted it's great i'm kind of blown away by it to be honest Th things are getting a little weird over in Yes, AI let's land. check in with with uh, with, with virtual Sarah, Sarah. And I said, then I said, "Are you dating anybody?" She says, "I'm dating a really sweet guy named Scott." Oh. <laughs> he, he's very understanding and is supportive beyond expectation. I said, "Scott sounds really great. Where did you meet him?" She says, we met on OkCupid of all places. On my first date with him, he gave me his Kindle with all of my favorite books on it. And I knew it was a sign. We became very close during COVID, and then he moved here. He's my rock. <laughs> and I said, where does Scott work? She says, he works from home. As a systems administrator, he also built himself an office that looks like the Starship Enterprise. Wow. With his work computer, a game console, and a small TV. He is a geek's geek. Oh, he wow. sounds like a catch. Yeah, well done. I mean, getting weird. Yeah, it's show him to weird. take him home to mom. Uh, I wonder if anybody else out there uh, creates a character at beta.character.ai. Uh, and if you do... Would you share some outtakes with us? Well, doctor, here we go. <laughs> per your request. Hi ho. <laughs> Tom, the DTNS host here. Kermit, my love. When do I get to take the stage? Uh, Piggy. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> the internet is completely different culture, isn't it? You said it. Everything here is immediately followed by sarcastic comments and nasty responses. Oh, yep, Ernie, we're finally can you hear where these we belong. Guys? <laughs> All right. I'm going to attempt my my chef. You ready? Here we go. Can't believe we're doing this. Ladies and gentlemen, the Swedish chef. Kermit, when do I get to take the stage? Uh, sorry, Piggy. Got to go. <laughs> that 
was a whole lot of fun and a whole lot of memories. Uh, thanks to everyone who made that year possible and continues to make things possible in the new year. Our patrons at patreon.com slash DTNS. We cannot do this without you. That is it for our holiday programming. We're going back to being live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with the beginning of our CES 2023 coverage. Talk to you then. 